Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode that I'm going to start with a question. Have you ever been in a situation with someone where when they're angry, they don't use words, but they roll their eyes, they stomp around, they slam a door, or are you the person that when you're angry and someone says, are you angry? You say no, but then you go slamming around the kitchen or slamming down a book. Anybody? Yes. Are you, if you're nodding your head, this episode is for you because in this episode, I'm going to talk about and teach you about how to gracefully shut down passive aggressive comments, even if they are your own. Sound good? All right. So let's start by just identifying what is passive aggressive communication. Well, it's indirect communication. So passive aggressive communication basically is you are trying to get your, um, how you feel across without owning it, without saying it, you are acting it out instead of talking it out. Or if you are talking it out, you're not being truthful. So, you know, we hear about the stereotypical situation where the wife is mad, you know, the husband, you know, is says, is something wrong? And the wife says, no, everything is fine. And then she looks out the window, she doesn't look at him. And then they, they're in the car and it's like awkward and long, long car ride. Anybody ever be in that situation? Yeah. But there's so much more to it than that. So let's start with why do people communicate in a passive aggressive way? Well, the first thing is modeled behavior. That's the beginning. It's something that you might have seen in your home. So think about, and don't worry, I'll have a little uh, tip sheet for you so that you can write your, your notes. So you can basically get a view into, if it's you, why you are that way. Why is it hard to draw boundaries and be straightforward and tell the truth about what's going on for you? Why is your first go-to to either be withdrawn in anger, because that's also a behavior, Right. And it's very easy and slippery because the person who's being withdrawn in anger goes, what? I just don't feel like talking. Nothing's wrong. And you're like, okay, well, it feels like something's wrong because you, you know that we're all energy. And when you go into a place, when you come home and maybe you didn't text the person back or whatever, and you walk in, the moment you walk in, you are aware that there is a chilly energy in the air or a hostile energy in the air. And then if you say to the person, is everything okay? And they go, yeah, why? I'm just cooking dinner. And it still doesn't feel like everything is okay. The reason why I care about you not communicating this way and about you shutting down other people in your life that you care about or don't care about shutting it down as well is because it's ineffective. How will you, as the person who's pissed off, get your needs met, be, be witnessed? How will that person change whatever it is that they're doing? And a lot of times it's a very familiar dance where you both know what you're doing, especially in long-term marriages or relationships, but you don't have the conversation. A lot of times it's about things that you're polarized about, things that you fight about often where it barely even has to get into the person doing the thing before you're already anticipating they're going to do it and you're already mad. But have you ever had the experience of communicating sort of in meta messages? So you're perhaps mad at your partner. They know it. They know exactly what they did wrong. They come home and they're chattier than usual. They're asking you more questions than they normally would. They're asking if they could help chop the vegetables, let's just say. Have you experienced this? So now this is a a behavior sort of making up for what they did wrong or what they feel like they did wrong because they don't want you to be mad. But again, by not having the conversation, what we're missing in all of that is an establishing that, okay, maybe we could do it differently next time. We're missing establishing why you were upset or why they were upset. So just sort of letting it blow over or pushing it under the rug 
These are also ways that passive aggressive communication keeps going. The person leaves the house angrily and then comes back with, you know, food or dessert or flowers and acts like nothing happened. But basically you'll have that same fight probably many times because the only way to not have that fight is to understand what it means to you or what it means to them. So all I can say about passive aggressive comments and communication is that it's ineffective and it's also really um, low energy. You know, you have people at work who do this. Have you been in a situation with someone you had to partner with? They were on a team with you and they used their, um, their lateness as a way to dominate you as a way to basically say F you. This is very common in relationships as well though, not just work relationships, just regular romantic relationships, friendships, that there is a hostility behind someone being late all the time. So I wonder, have you guys had this experience or are you the person who is late all the time? Are you nodding your head right now? Yeah. It can be so incredibly frustrating. I used to have this dynamic with my husband and I was always very early and kind of as a little bit of a psycho, he was always sort of time uh, neutral, like didn't really care, but he would make me late. And he certainly of course would, would be responding to my, um, my anxiety about timeliness. I really was a time bully sort of myself that I judged people. If you're not early, then you're late and all this other crap. Like I, I had my own stuff, trust me. But Vic and I had such, have always had a really good relationship and good communication. We both had tons of therapy before we got married. Um, so the fact that we had this reoccurring issue about time was really weird. So I finally bring it into my therapist, like what is the deal? with this, what is the deal? And she said, well, you know, Tara, a lot of times someone making you late, it's a passive aggressive way of expressing anger that's too threatening or too uncomfortable for them to acknowledge. So then she asked me a couple of questions. She said, does Vic get mad at you ever? And I said, no. And she said, does he tell you when you're doing something that's bothering him? I said, no, not, not really. He's kind of an easygoing Pisces, I was saying. And she said, okay, but you're also a therapist, Tara. You realize there's no possible way that you're never doing anything that's getting on his nerves. It's impossible. I don't care how good the relationship is. This is called like being a human being. I was like, okay. So, and she, I said, so tell me more. What do you think is happening? And she explained the passive aggressive anger dynamic that, but it made me understand it for the first time. And I was already a therapist and I understood the concept of passive aggressive communication, but the anger dynamic, I didn't get. So she said, imagine that Vic has anger or at you about things that he, it's too threatening though, right? He was, you know, raising three teenage kids by himself and he just doesn't want there to be any problems maybe, which is probably true. And, you know, hoping that I just would want to stay and love them and have them become my family, which is what happened luckily for everybody. But it's like he didn't want to rock the boat. So his own anger, he, he wasn't even aware of it. It was unconscious. So he was taking his anger and disavowing it. So imagine that for those of you who are watching on YouTube, it's like you're cutting it off and then taking that anger and sort of stuffing it down the throat of the other person. So what would happen is his anger that he couldn't feel was afraid to feel the way that he would provoke it in me. So I would express it. So because his anger still needed to come out was by being late. So we had a pivotal moment. So right. He'd be late. Let me, let me finish that thought. He'd be late. And then I would go, I would then flip out. Right. And be like, I don't get it. Why, why are we having the same conversation? I told you we needed to leave at this time. It's already 10 minutes after that time. Ah, so he would be like, no, no, there was whatever. Okay, fine. So I, I'm talking to Ruth, my therapist, and she was like, listen, you know, you have to do something different. And I was like, okay. She's like, you have to stop doing 
you're 50% of the dance. I was like, okay, well, how do I do that? She said, Terry, look at your own dysfunction with time. You're always early. You're like a, you know, a time bully. So that's your thing. So you've got to be like a little bit consciously and with intention, take a little bit of a deep breath around time. You don't always have to be the first person at the wedding. You don't always have to be the first person in the church. Like I would never go to a wedding without going to the church. You know, like how some people just go, it's fine. We'll go to the thing. No. And I always have to be in the front row. Like it was a little obsessive, my own thing. So she and I talked about that a little bit, worked on that. I was like, okay, I'm going to be it doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world. I don't want to fight with him about time. It's so crazy. So we're going to a wedding and this was now going to be where we were going to test out if I could not do my part of the dance and how that would impact us fighting about time. So we're going to a friend's wedding and I, you know, I said we needed to leave, whatever. The wedding was 90 minutes away. I gave us like two and a half hours to get there again, a little bit like a crazy person. So he said, listen, I will definitely be back ready to go at one o'clock. I was like, great. So keep in mind, it's 12 o'clock. I'm already showered. My hair's done. My makeup's on and I'm dressed. So I'm, you know, I said, okay, I'll get your, your tux. It was dressy. I said, I'll get your tux ready. So it'll be ready when you come home. You just jump in the shower, get in it and we'll go. So I'm waiting and I'm breathing and I'm meditating and I'm being so chill and I'm internally working like no problem. I am not having a problem with this. No matter what happens, I am not doing it. So he comes, he drives up in the car. We had this MVP car at the time and there's wood on top of the car and he's pulling up two minutes before I said we needed to be on the road. So he's already doing his half of the dance. He's coming in. He's like, I'm really sorry, babe. You know, someone was in front of me. They were maybe whatever. And I was like, oh, no, it's not a problem. I, I gave us extra time. It's not a problem. Maybe, uh, your tux is ready to go. He can't even grasp that I'm doing a different dance. He can't even grasp it in his mind. Can't even get it. <laughs> He's continuing to do the old dance saying, if that person hadn't been slow doing 20 miles an hour under, in front of me, I was like, Vic, I'm not mad just get it together. I'm having a cup of tea. I'm enjoying myself. I'm reading the paper. Go do your thing. So he's like, all right, I'll be right down. You know, anyway, so we get in the car and he's still, I see him trying to get me not mad with the behavior, right? Of being overly friendly, tell me what he's going to build this and that. We left 35 minutes after I said we should have left, but I gave us plenty of time. So it was still fine. And I also realized if I didn't get the entire wedding, if I wasn't there for the whole thing, that also wasn't going to be the end of the world. Like I needed to shift my, my own neuroses around time as well. So in the car, he's doing this whole dance, continuing to be like, so, and I'm actually not mad. It was sort of this pivot for me where I was like, this is a beautiful day. We're going to a wedding that I really want to go to a friend who I really love. It's going to be so much fun. I don't want to waste this day. I'm not wasting this day on this same effing fight as if it were Groundhog's Day. You know that movie where the person wakes up and every day is the same freaking day? Well, I do not want to do that. So about midway through, I said, you seem kind of surprised that I'm not mad and that I wasn't mad. And he said, well, to be honest, I, I was. And I said, you know, I'm definitely willing, like one thing I'm positive, Vic, is that I don't want to have the same fight with you for the rest of our life. We have this really, really good thing. And this is like a petty, weird, stupid thing that's happening. And I don't want to do it. I talked to Ruth about it. Do you want to hear what she thinks? That was my therapist. And he was like, uh, okay. And I said, Ruth thinks that you being late is an expression of anger that it's too threatening for you to express. And he was like, I don't, what, what do you mean? What, what would I be mad about you? What mad at you about? I'm not mad at you. I was like, no, I'm not saying you're mad, babe. I'm saying you never want to be though. You make excuses for my bad behavior. If I'm being kind of bitchy, if I apologize, you tell me I didn't do anything wrong. So what I'm telling you is that it is hard enough for me to process my own anger because I wasn't raised in a family, you know, it was a whole thing. So. I can't process mine and yours at the same time. So I explained how Ruth explained it, that he's disavowing it, but being late because he knows I'm going to blow up is like him shoving his anger down my throat. And now I'm expressing it with my overreaction to his lateness, 
coupled with my own weirdness about time, right? Makes sense? So he was like, I don't know. I'm not buying it. But I was like, here's the thing. What I'm telling you is I'm done doing this dance about time. I'm not doing it. So whatever that looks like, either I will not care about time at all. So so we then we had a whole meeting about it, he and I, where we decided that he would help me be less like obsessive about time and that I would help him be more on time when it was for me. That was it. And so we came up with these little phrases that we would share. Like we, uh, we'll, we always have exactly the right amount of time was one of the ones that we started saying. So if I started to get anxious and said, you know, we should have left or whatever, he's like, no, babe, we, we always have the, exactly the right amount of time or everything is going to be okay. And instead of feeling like he was doing it to me or like I was doing it to him, we sort of got together to help each other be less nuts about time and to not act out. I did not want him passively, aggressively expressing his anger to me in this unconscious way. So he stopped doing that. And lo and behold, he does not have any problems expressing his anger or annoyance with me about things or his preferences. And I really wanted him to be able to do that. And you know, it's 20 years later, I want to be funny and say, be careful what you wish for. But in reality, I wouldn't have it any other way because I fully care about precisely how Vic would like his life to be. And if I can do anything to make his life like that, that is without a doubt a top priority for me. So while that was a long way around the barn to get back to, what can you do with the passive aggressive stuff? So the family stuff and on the cheat sheet or the tip sheet, I'm gonna give you a few questions so that you can answer the questions to see where you learned it, if this is the way you express yourself when you're anxious or upset or have something to say that you are too sort of fearful to say. So that's the first piece. The second piece, if you're dealing with someone who's passive aggressive, is to hold steady eye contact. So if you're at work and someone makes like a like douchey comment, you hold the steady eye contact. Like you're basically saying, for those watching, you can see like, I see what you're doing. Like I got you in my sights. So, and I don't mean aggressively or hostily. I really don't. I mean, steady eye contact. So you're like, I'm not just going to slough it over or, you know, brush it under the rug because by not looking at you and being like, huh, laughing awkwardly, I'm going to look at you and be like, yes, are you actually saying something to me? Um, and don't answer the question. If someone is being passive aggressive and answering, asking you something that is inappropriate or that you don't want to answer, your real power is not answering the question and questioning the question. I did an interview um, that you guys can see on the podcast um, a few weeks ago. It just came out with a woman named Kasha Urbaniak, who's very brilliant and one of the things that she talks about in her verbal self-defense course is that if someone asks you something aggressive and or passive aggressive, you can question their question. And it could be as simple as, wait, so I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Are you asking me to give you details about my divorce right now? Is that what's happening? To give them a chance to say, well, I mean, no, not if you're uncomfortable. Oh, good, good, because I am. So we won't be talking about that, but it's like, Instead of giving the information, which many of us, especially women, are very um, conditioned to just someone ask you a question, you feel like it's rude not to answer before even thinking about how rude the question may be. So you can question the questioner's question. Um, what else can you do? Um, basically remove yourself. So there, there's the, the last step, and you can't really do this with work stuff, but in relationships where you can remove yourself, you can just not be in a conversation with someone who's endlessly passive aggressive. If it's family, of course, then you need to find a way to draw the boundary. So that'll be the last part of this, which is what language could you use when someone is denying they're upset, but their behavior says they're upset or they're saying something mean I had a friend once who said to me, I, cu I cut my hair short. And she was like, oh my God, you cut your hair finally. It's so matronly. And I was like, wait, did you just effing use the word matronly with my fake compliment that you just gave me? So I didn't say that. I, it took me aback and I was like, 12 seconds went by and I was like, 
you know the word matronly. You know what it means, right? And she was like, well, yeah. I was like, so that was meant to be an insult. Is that correct? No, no, no. I think it looks great. Well, that isn't true because if you thought it looks great, you wouldn't have used the word matronly. So would you like to revise your statement? <laughs> you know, and she was like, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant mature. I was like, bad word as well, but okay, fine. So using language, being able to actually go directly at someone denies what they're doing. So let's do the example of someone who you're saying, you, you seem upset, are you mad? And they say, no, I'm not mad, I'm just exhausted. Okay, well, it's, it's interesting, Betty, that you suddenly got exhausted right after we had the conversation about something. So you seem mad at me about something. That, that's what it feels like to me. If they say no, say, okay, well, I'm feeling that energy. So I'm just telling you, if you are upset with me about something, I'm, I'm actually interested to know what it is. So just know that you can always talk to me because this feels uncomfortable. I sense that something's wrong. My gut instinct tells me that something's wrong, that you're upset, and then you're telling me nothing's wrong. So there's a disconnect somewhere, and I'm not saying I couldn't be wrong, I could be, sure. But I don't feel like I am in this instance, because I find that when you and I have conflict, in the beginning, you will deny that you're upset. So I'm just inviting you to tell me what's going on, because I really care, or something like that. All right, I know that was like long as hell, but you guys get the point that there's a way to honor your own experience, which is like, hey, I feel like this is happening. This is what it feels like to me. And if the person denies it, hey, we can't make them not deny it, right? But you can still say, okay. But I wanna tell you, it still feels like something's up to me. Leave it there. Anyway, wow, that was a lot about passive aggressive, gracefully shutting down passive aggressive comments, whether it is your own, whether it is someone else's. Because you know what? I want you to communicate effectively, efficiently, and directly, which you can do with ease, grace, and when appropriate love. You don't have to be passive aggressive. And it is inefficient, ineffective. So, uh, and, and this is the beginning, you guys. Real love revolution season is upon us. So I'm gonna be talking about communication and love and sex and passion and anything else that you people are interested in hearing about. So if you have not joined, ladies, my Facebook group, it's called Real Love Revolution Facebook group with Terry Cole, please do so that you don't miss a thing because we're doing weekly questions and I'm gonna be resurrecting my Wednesday wisdom. So I really want you to be there with me. And if you liked this and felt like it added some value to you or it was helpful, please share it on your social media platforms or with people who could use it. Please do not share it in a passive aggressive way with your passive aggressive mother. <laughs> if you send it to your mother and she's passive aggressive, you can say, I think this might help you. I hope you watch it. <laughs> in the meantime, I hope you guys have an amazing, amazing week. And as always, take care of you.